Well, welcome everyone to the afternoon portion of uh, the 2021 SOP Symposium. I hope you've all been having a great time. I have been thoroughly enjoying myself. And um, we're now in the late afternoon portion of our session and I will be, I'm here to introduce uh, Professor Carl Bergstrom. My name is Erome and I'm a postdoc at the um, College of Pharmacy and I've, I'm also part of the um, uh, SOPS 2021 Symposium Organizing Committee. And today it is truly my joy and my delight to introduce Professor Bergstrom, who is a professor of biology at the University of um, Washington in Seattle. And he studies information, how information is processed and stored and used in the genome, but his interest is in information um, has a much wider scope, as you will learn today. Instead of just focusing on genomes, he also studies what he calls the science of science, how science is performed, how science is communicated among scientists, but also how that information is disseminated to the wider public. And today he's here to tell us more about that information. Um, I encourage you to check out his website, uh, ctbergstrom.com. And there you will find a lot of interesting things about <laughs> Professor Bergstrom, including the fact that he loves birds, <laughs> ravens in particular. Anyone who follows him on Twitter knows this. Uh, he is a great photographer. And um, he's also the uh, co-author on uh, at least two books, one on evolution and one on developing or cultivating the um, art of skepticism in a data driven word, world and maybe a, a little bit of a colorful world word that I'm a little maybe too shy to say <laughs> up here on stage. And you can get more information about a course that he and a colleague, Javin West, have uh, developed on how to be a better scientist, on how to be a better communicator. So today he's going to talk to us about misinformation in the context of COVID-19. And so I'm really, really excited uh, to hear what he has to say to us. Let me just set the groundwork here for the program. After Professor Bergstrom does the talk, we're gonna have a Q&A session. So I really want to encourage you to take notes, to write down your questions, to prepare your comments. And at the end of his talk, we'll walk around with the mic, we'll pass the mic around, we'll try to get to as many of your questions as um, possible. So with that, Professor Bergstrom, thank you so much for joining us. We're all ears and I'm handing the time and space over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Arome. I'm not in my usual um, uh, space, so I don't have the usual microphone set up and things like that. If you have problems hearing me, please just let me know and I can adjust and we'll work that out as we, as we go along. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for the, uh, for the, you know, the invitation. It's an honor to be here and I look forward to talking with you over the next, uh, over the next hour, hour and a half. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and, and dive right in. So, you know, as, as Arome said, I've uh, um, uh, been very, very interested in information and how it spreads and, and, how, uh, um, and how misinformation spreads through social networks. And uh, I've also trained as an epidemiologist. And so when COVID broke out, um, these you know, two interests of mine came together in a rather unfortunate uh, manner. Um, but here we are. And, uh, and so what I wanna do is, let's see, I'm just gonna put this uh, window to the side. And, I, and what I wanna do is tell you about that. So let's, let's go ahead and go um, and do that. So um, I, I should just start out with a disclosure. I will be talking a little bit about testing, COVID testing. So I sh should disclose that I have a paid consulting relationship with Color Health. That's a company that provides testing services and logistical support for COVID vaccinations. So um, I won't be talking directly about that, but because I'm mentioning these things, I just want to put that out there. But let's start out with um, what happened at the start of 2020. And we've known this for a long time as epidemiologists that uh, it was only a matter of time. Sooner or later, we were gonna face a large scale um, infectious disease pandemic, uh, probably of a respiratory virus. Um, and, uh, and so last year our luck ran out and the COVID pandemic obviously upended everyone's lives in dramatic ways. We all had to become epidemiologists uh, in, order to, um, in order to figure out I'm sorry, I'm just trying to um, get my screen to work properly here, um, in order to figure out how to, how to make the decisions that we needed to on a daily basis to keep our families safe and to keep ourselves safe and to, um, and to plan for, for our future. Um, 
we relied a lot on the media to help us figure out what was happening on, on social media on traditional media um, to try to understand all of this. And uh, um, we sort of, you know, the, the, the challenge was we were beginning with all of this scientific uncertainty. We had this virus um, that we knew nothing about because, and I should say autumn 2019, had a virus that had never been in humans until autumn uh, 2019. So there was no way for us to understand how this worked in, in, in human populations. And so, you know, immediately as we start to recognize that there's a pandemic going on, there are all of these questions that we're facing, you know, what's the infection fatality rate? How many cases are there? How fast does it spread? What are the long-term consequences? How long does immunity ask? Uh, and, and so forth. So all of these questions that, uh, that, that we don't have answers to. Um, and that creates this massive uncertainty vacuum, if you will. So, 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 uh, massive scale um, uh, situation where everybody wants desperately to know the answers to all of these questions. Solid answers aren't out there. And so what happens is of course, as, in, as people search for answers, all kinds of things flow into that uncertainty vacuum that may not be accurate. So um, maybe a lot of, you know, this is, for example, a, a chart of, uh, of infection fatality rates um, estimates for COVID across different papers, right? So you've got all this uncertainty. And then into that, you know, one of the first things we see are all these organized disinformation campaigns in February 2020 by uh, organized opponents of the, um, of, the, um, of the Chinese government, for example, that are pushing propaganda about, uh, about say, that there have been, you know, as of February 2020, there have actually been hundreds of thousands of deaths and it's all being covered up and, and things like that. Um, we see disingenuous governmental messaging, right? This is what we saw in the United States. We've got uh, you know, situations where, uh, where the U.S. government is saying, oh, you know, we've got 15 people and it's going to go back down to zero. We've got this completely contained. Um, and most of the evidence suggested that that was not actually what people believed to be the truth at the time that those messages were being given. Uh, we've seen a lot of these uh, fake studies and, and so-called astroturfing where you have, uh, you know, organizations that, that purport to be sort of you know, grassroots uh, sets of researchers or things like that, pr producing very slick um, scientific sounding studies by you know, anonymous academics who were afraid to, of retaliation if they spoke honestly to say that hydroxychloroquine worked or something like that. Um, but when you read these studies, they're absolute garbage, but they um, you know, make very transparent um, silly mistakes uh, or, or just ludicrous in general. Um, you know, here are example is people were claiming that they'd done a two, uh, you know, a 2.6 billion person randomized controlled trial, which is impossible and you can read into it and it's um, rubbish. Um, but you see those things going up. There were dreadful preprints that are being posted. Um, at, uh, the, the one I've got showing here was a preprint that was only posted for two days um, on MedArchive before it was retracted. It claimed that the uh, that COVID had had pieces of the HIV genome in it, and therefore was an engineered. Therefore, it was an engineered bioweapon. This turned out to be basically due to mistakes in the way that they were using the genomic software. Um, it was debunked in two days and retracted, and yet um, it has one of the highest alt metric scores. That is for media and social media engagement of any paper ever published. Um, so somehow the fact that it was complete garbage and, and very quickly overturned was not enough to keep it from flowing into that uncertainty vacuum where people were looking for answers. Equally dreadful peer reviewed work at left, we've got a paper that is claiming to have a physical model for how 5G causes the uh, spontaneous formation of coronavirus particle, coronavirus like particles, virus like particles inside the body. Um, that is absolutely um, incoherent. Uh, the paper right was, uh, was far more damaging. This was a paper that was published in the Lancet um, that claimed to have found uh, um, evidence that hydroxychloroquine was leading to, use was leading to strongly negative outcomes among patients that were getting it on the grounds of this paper. The hydroxychloroquine trials, a number of hydroxychloroquine trials were canceled um, uh, because it was thought to be unsafe to keep people in the treatment groups. It now seems very unlikely that the, that the data um, that, that, that the data existed at all, that this paper was essentially fraud. Um, so, you know, we see all of this kind of stuff. 
Um, we see organized agnotogenesis. That means that the, the deliberate manufacturing of doubt. This is the sort of uh, you know, big tobacco, big oil playbook where you don't try to necessarily convince people completely that these things are harmless, but rather that you try to create enough doubt to stave off regulatory action. Um, so we've seen a number of um, you know, there was a lot of, especially, you know, during the, during the first six, eight months of the pandemic, a lot of argument that the pandemic was, uh, you know, not as bad as the flu and, and that the um, death numbers were wildly inflated. And these were coming from um, various think tanks and the likes that were well-funded and producing very slick material and, and coming up with lists of prestigious sounding scientific advisors and so on. Uh, we see a lot of sloppy reporting. We'll talk about this issue, um, this example a little bit, but the, you know, information we were getting from the mainstream news was not that they were trying to deceive us, just that they were not sufficiently quantitatively and scientifically literate to be doing a good job of informing us. Um, we saw, you know, a lot of overhyped press releases that were coming out of, uh, out of, from university studies that were then sort of being credulously repeated by the news. So um, I probably won't talk about this a, a lot during the main talk, but we can come back around to it. The major source of disinformation around scientific issues actually is university press offices and the press releases that they issue. And um, you know, that's actually been, been studied um, quantitatively and, and so forth. And that's been a serious problem. Of course, there are always people who see a crisis as a career opportunity and stake out various perspectives and try to um, you know, push those perspectives to, to generate large scale media followings and appear on talk news every night and all of that. Um, because the pandemic was so heavily politicized, um, all these different interests had reasons to try to, um, you know, push public belief in one way or another. And, and science, as you know, we always, you know, you, if you take any question that's reasonably well researched, you're going to get this sort of curve of, of results. You're going to, you know, have some people that, that say, you know, whatever this phenomenon doesn't exist or it's very small, or people say it's very large. And then you've kind of got, you know, maybe I'm going Gaussian or something where you know, some of the studies are clustering in the middle. But when you have a, a politicized landscape, um, instead of presenting that whole distribution or stuff around the center of the distribution, one side will be basically picking from the far left tail, the other side picking from the far right tail, pushing those narratives um, to, to, to the exclusion of the others. Um, and all of this then gets wrapped up um, in the authority of numbers and quantitative information, which is I'm about to talk about. It's particularly challenging for people to, uh, to, to question, to dispute, to feel like they as, um, you know, or we as, as ordinary individual civilians have any, uh, have any right or ability to, to question. Um, and so we're left with the situation where people don't know who it is that they can trust. You've got all this different information out there. It's mutually contradictory. Um, people don't know how to make sense of it themselves. They don't know who to trust. And this leaves us in this very damaging position um, inadvertently, essentially, mostly, uh, but, but analogous to what Gary Kasparov described as the sort of the, the point of modern propaganda, the so-called falsehood firehose strategy that was developed by Russia um, and used in the Ukraine and, and, and getting used more broadly um, elsewhere. Uh, the point of modern propaganda isn't to misinform or push an agenda, it's to exhaust your critical thinking, to annihilate truth. And the idea of the falsehood firehose strategy is to push multiple, instead of trying to you know, convince everybody of a single lie, you push multiple mutually contradictory narratives at high volume through through the information ecosystem and leave people uh, despairing for, that they that they have any hope of ever sorting all of that out. So that's the um, and then we kind of ended up there by accident in this in this COVID pandemic. And so and you know the problem is is that you know, a lot of us not so many of us have the training to see through this kind of misinformation. We're we're good at spotting uh, you know BS words. Um, you know we're fairly good at, at, at under, you know picking out uh, you know corporate weasel speak or, or politicians, false empty promises and things like that. But numbers are a lot, a lot harder. Seeing through numbers um, can be a lot, lot harder for a, number, for a whole bunch of reasons. One is that they seem to come straight from nature. You know, the, um, uh, words feel subjective and they feel like they're you know, coming from for, for particular people, their opinions, their, you know, that sort of thing. Numbers feel like something that just exists out there, right? It almost has to, almost has this kind of you know, divine authority to it um, because they're, they're inevitable in a sense. Like I mean, if you measure something and you're not lying about the measurement, that's the truth. There's no room, it feels like, for, for questioning the same way that uh, 
the same way that, that sort of you know, verbal descriptions can be. And, and part of the reason, there are a whole bunch of reasons it feels that way, partly because they're technical and, 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 and it feels difficult to, to you know, question numbers and, and results of statistical analyses that maybe we have never learned about or, or never or don't remember how it work. And, and also that we just are not in higher education, I think, doing a good job of teaching our students how to question numbers the same way we do in um, in, in courses in the humanities or a philosophy course or a literature course or something where you've got these you know, contradictory ideas and you bash them up against each other and, and try to find you know, you know, um, some kind of synthesis of, of, of uh, thesis and antithesis. And um, we don't do that so much in, 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 higher, in STEM education. Um, we typically teach people to do the mechanics. You know, how do you um, invert a matrix? How do you write a random forest algorithm? How do you run a gel? How do you do a blast search? But we don't do nearly as much talking about how you actually do critical thinking. Um, what do you do when you have um, a range of different scientific studies that yield results that aren't contradictory? How do you parse that out and understand what's going on? Um, and so in order to, so this has been something I've been interested for in a while. I started um, teaching a course in, uh, um, in 2017 um, called Calling Bullshit um, that, uh, that teaches students to think critically about numbers and to question numbers. And, and it's a course that's intended for, uh, for a general audience of students, not just for you know, um, students with advanced background in math or statistics or anything like that. But we have students from 40 majors across the campus. A lot of them are in the humanities and the arts and things like that. Um, and so we're trying to show everyone that they can be empowered to do this without having this kind of fancy training. We've also been really, really interested in the ways that misinformation um, comes into science and, and, and sort of uh, is perpetuated in science in, in, in ways that are sort of you know, analogous to what we see um, in the social and, uh, and traditional media spaces. And there's a lot of these phenomena that happen in science as well. And so um, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot during the COVID pandemic. I've spent a lot of time doing public communication around COVID and and COVID misinformation, um, trying to help the public make sense of all of these things. And so what I want to do in much of the talk today is, uh, you know, I, I at this point could go in two different directions. One would be to um, you know, give you a talk that was basically about how we got here, how did, what, what's happened on social and media and with the evolution of traditional media that's led to such a, um, you know, misinformation fruitful mm -hmm. ecosystem. But what I'm gonna do instead in this talk is just tell you about, uh, about some of the kinds of misinformation that are out there around COVID. Uh, what, you know, what's, what kinds of classes of, of you know, confusions are out there, the kinds of places that they come from, and just give you a bunch of examples of the sorts of stuff that we're thinking about with and dealing with every day and in, try to give you a sense of why this, why this kind of COVID misinformation is so pervasive <laughs> and so challenging. And one of the kind of key themes that you'll see as I go forward is that this is not coming from, uh, you know, say, uh, um, you know, a small number of, uh, of, you know, contrarian social media sites or something like that. I mean, that this is, this kind of misinformation is, is everywhere from, you know, uh, respected scholarly journals to, um, to the media, to um, conversations on, on social media, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so let's dive into that. And, and, and as I do this, you know, I'm kind of bringing, there, when, when we wrote this book um, calling Bullshit, we finished, we, we sent the book in, um, final, final uh, you know, page proofs we, we sent in in, in uh, December 2019, so right before the pandemic started. And, you know, I could go back in a sense and I could rewrite that entire book if I had to using only examples from COVID. And to some extent, I'm gonna take you through some of the major classes of, of things that go wrong that we talk about in the book, um, but, it, but, but use those COVID examples. Um, so you know, one, of the, one of the key things that we, that's, that's very basic, but we spend a long time you know, telling our students to think about, and, and, and which turns out to be really pervasive uh, when we look at the way we get misinformed, is just to think about the way that numbers are presented and misrepresented in the world. And there's kind of a key um, rule that we have, which is that you know, numbers need to always be presented in context. For numbers for, to be useful or informative or meaningful to you, they've got to be presented in a context that allows you to make useful comparisons. So let me give you an example of that. Here's the NBC News saying, uh, you know, wow, the next, pre for preventing the next pandemic will cost, and then there's like a 
you know, a couple of twos and then just this shock string of zeros, right? Zero, 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 zero. And you just look at that and you're just like, oh my God, that's so expensive. Like, look at all those zeros. And, uh, and that's sort of the, you know, the message they're trying to get across there. Um, that's not presented. This number is not presented in a way that remotely allows you to make meaningful comparisons. So first of all, we'd like to know, um, you know, I mean, why not write that it's $22.2 billion a year? It's much kind of hard to see how many is that, is that millions? Is it trillions? Is it billion? I can't tell at a glance. $22 billion a year. Um, and then we can put that into context. So, uh, you know, some, some estimates have the cost of the uh, pandemic to the U.S. economy is about $8 trillion. Um, so we could spend that $22 billion a year, even if the U.S. footed the entire world's bill for, uh, for, for preventing the next pandemic, we could spend $22 billion a year for centuries and come out ahead. Um, the U.S. federal budget is $4.79 trillion. So this is less than a half a percent of the U.S. budget. Uh, again, if the U.S. You know, paid the whole bill for this, well, there's 330 million people in the U.S., $67 per capita annually to prevent the next pandemic. So these are the kinds of um, numbers that, all, that allow you to make meaningful comparisons. And instead of saying like, oh, this big shock and awe string of zeros, you say, okay, um, you know, for a quite minor um, uh, uh, you know, increase in our, uh, in our tax expenditures, we could prevent um, having society turned on its head as it has been for the last 20 months. So that would be a way that would, you know, that would allow you to make more meaningful comparisons. Uh, numbers should be presented in context and so and, and allow you to make comparisons. They also have to allow you to make fair comparisons. So here's an example. This is the Information is Beautiful website. Um, put up this graphic in April 2020, and it was trying to allow you to make comparisons ostensibly. So saying, hey, look, don't freak out about the coronavirus. The average daily deaths uh, for the coronavirus are just 56. And here are some comparisons for average daily deaths of a bunch of other diseases. And at the time I complained about this because, um, because this wasn't, a, it was a comparison, but it wasn't a fair comparison. In the, in the, at this point, coronavirus was few isolated outbreaks in few spots in New York, in Seattle, in China, um, in Northern Italy, in Iran. And it was, not, um, it was not endemic in the places where it would become endemic the way that the rest of these diseases are. And so I said, well, that's not a fair comparison. You don't know, um, you know, you can't, you can't say, well, this number is small now because you're just, you, you, we haven't even gotten started with COVID. And if you, uh, you know, in fact, you know, I updated this a year after it was posted. Um, and so if you then, if you then look at the average number of coronavirus, death, coronavirus deaths per day worldwide over the first year of the pandemic, um, you get a very, very different picture. And, uh, and of course you can see that, you can see that here. And, and then now you see that, well, COVID uh, and things would be even worse if we extended that out, you know, up until the present, but, but uh, you know, the, the average number of daily deaths attributed to COVID are much, much larger than, uh, than indicated there. So I'm just gonna close this, make this stop being, um, there we go. Okay, um, so just another, another example of kind of that need for fair comparison. Back. Um, another really interesting area that we talk about in the book that we think about um, and that's really you know, hurt us in a bunch of uh, ways during, during this pandemic is the notion of Goodert's Law and Campbell's Law. And these are the sort of the effects of measures um, on the, uh, on the measures of social systems and social activities on the systems themselves. So Goodert's Law, Maryland, it was laid out kind of complicated spoken as only an economist could speak it, but then anthropologist Marilyn Strathern uh, comes back and, and, and rephrases it in this very memorable uh, phrase, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So it doesn't measure the things that, that, it, was, that, that it had hoped to anymore. And, and that's of course, because when a measure becomes a target for people, they can adapt their behavior to optimize that measure without necessarily doing whatever you were hoping um, it would do. Uh, Campbell's law, um, and again, I've refer, tried to rephrase this myself to stick into to, uh, Dr. Strathern's um, you know, style. When a measure becomes a target, people do stupid things. So Campbell's law says, you know, not only is the measurement not useful as a measurement anymore, but the fact that people are trying to game that measurement causes them to do sort of the opposite of what you'd like them to do. And this is you know, Campbell's one of the Campbell's law paper is talking about examples where um, you're trying to improve teaching in, uh, in K-12 and so you start using standardized tests to hold teachers accountable and so forth. 
And, um, and you know, the hope is by doing so you can improve teaching. Uh, but, but what happens is once you do that, then people start teaching to these standardized tests and you lose a lot of the valuable parts of, of, the, of education. Um, and, and instead, uh, um, you know, just have kids drilling for these tests all day long. And, and so the measure turns out to be counterproductive. Um, we've seen this happen over and over again during COVID. Uh, here's my favorite example. Uh, so, so the CDC defined uh, a close contact as 15 minutes um, within six feet of a person who had COVID. And so the Iowa school district didn't want to have to um, you know, quarantine classrooms after quarantine kids um, after exposures in classrooms. And so what they did was they literally had the kids get up every 12 to 14 minutes and walk around uh, and then sit down again. And then the idea was, well, this way, um, these kids would not uh, uh, ever have a close contact under the CDC's definition. Uh, in other words, the CDC's definition became a target and then they went and did something amazingly stupid, which was, you know, first of all, disrupted class by having these kids walk around. And second of all, gave further opportunity for viral mixing by this, by this walk around and sit down procedure that they, that they implemented. So that's kind of a classic example there. And we saw this at a much bigger scale in the United States with, uh, with the Trump administration's you know, now well-documented effort to slow down coronavirus testing in the United States. They saw the uh, number of positive cases in the US as sort of a referendum on their management of the, of the crisis. And so they wanted to keep those numbers as low as possible. Now, coronavirus testing is an absolutely key element of um, coronavirus you know, prevention, both in the surveillance capacity, but also because it's a disease that spreads prior to uh, symptoms, uh, the widespread proactive testing can allow you to catch cases of people who you know, either don't have symptoms, don't yet know they're symptomatic, or people that uh, have only very small symptoms and think it's seasonal allergies or a flu or a, flu or a cold or something like that. And so um, they can be very, very important for pandemic control. We ended up uh, sort of gutting our ability to respond with, with uh, rapid and, and high frequency tests um, in the United States, because uh, the administration was trying to game these, game these metrics. And classic Campbell's law example. Not only were the metrics no good, um, but they were, uh, um, they they were, uh, you know, people then did stupid things in return. And you know, I mean, the, uh, you know, it's it, depending on how, and, you know, there are different ways to do these metrics. If you look at something like you know, the total number of cases, obviously testing slows down. You might hope that something like the, uh, like the, um, like the test positivity rate would, would uh, be, would remain a good metric, but depending on how you measure that here, this may be a little close to home for you, but um, depending on how you measure that, I just dug this up this morning. Um, even that may, uh, May, you may, may have incentives to keep the uh, number of tests low, even for test positivity rate, if you calculate the way the University of Kentucky did. Um, last fall, they were calculating the uh, positivity rate on campus as the total number of cases they'd found by testing divided by the total number of students on campus. So the total number of, of positive tests divided by the total number of people they ought to be tested, not by the, not by the total number of tests that were actually done. So and this is another example of the sort of ways you can, you can see how statistics can be misused or, um, or you know, first of all, this is gonna make the numbers, you know, if, if you're testing less than once, you know, if you're testing people, uh, um, if you're testing less than the whole campus in a, in a round of testing, then, then by dividing by the total population that you need to test instead of the total number of tests, you're gonna make positivity rates look lower. Um, but that also creates these perverse incentives where you can make them look lower and lower the less you test. And, and so you have those kinds of problems as well. <clears throat> so um, that's the kind of Goodard's Law, Campbell's Law issue. There are just general issues in logical thinking that keep getting us over and over again. A lot of these are coming through, you know, things like mainstream media accounts. So here was a story that led to a lot of panic um, in, uh, in August of 2020. Um, the uh, CDC released a report that, that said, um, <clears throat> well, it said, it, when it said, we now have enough data to know that people who've been infected for uh, three months are not getting reinfected during that time span. But the way that it got reported in the popular media um, 
And, and, and this, I mean, here I'm showing ABC, but, but the other media outlets either copied each other or made the same mistake. They say, um, people who've been infected with COVID-19 and recovered are protected for up to three months and can safely interact with others. Now, what the CDC study said was that people who were recovered were protected for at least three months. So it's a really different story. But the way this gets put out is that, well, it's up to three months. And so then people start panicking, saying like, oh, wow, you know, we only get three months of, um, of, uh, of immunity. We'll never get around COVID. Um, and, uh, and that created a lot of, um, you know, a lot of enormous amount of anxiety and concern. And, and really, this is basic logic, right? So the, the CDC, you know, if P is, is you're within three months of your previous infection and, and Q is uh, you can get reinfected, the CDC says P implies not Q. If you're, if you're within three months, you cannot get reinfected. The news outlets then re, you know, reverse that by this in, improper syllogism. Um, that, that's not the case. They said, so P implies not Q. That does not mean that not P implies Q. That's what the, what, that's what the news outlets reported. They said, if you're not within three months of previous infection, you can get reinfected, which does not necessarily follow and led to this undue panic just because people weren't thinking clearly about things. There's not this sort of you know, logical literacy um, at, you know, in, in, the, in, in media outlets, among other things. Um, here's another example. Stat should know better than this. This is a this is you know probably the leading sort of general readership uh, uh, medical um, publication that's not designed for physicians or, or practitioners, but just for the general public. Um, so this was a this they this was they said you know one in four Americans were unable to get a COVID nineteen test uh, when they wanted when they wanted one. Um, and they were saying, you know, and, then, and that's not actually so bad, was the sort of claim, was that, well, 75% of people were getting tests when they wanted one. But here are the data. Um, the, uh, what they found was um, uh, there, there were, um, you know, they, they had a class of people who'd never wanted a test, and then they had a bunch of people who wanted a test and couldn't get them for various reasons. Um, 50, 45% didn't want to test, 55% did want to test. 24% were unable to get one, 30. And you know, we you only know if the, you know you only know if someone was able to get one if they actually wanted one, right? And so what 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 they what they found here was of the 55% who wanted to get a test, um, only 31% were able to. So 44% of the population was unable to get a test when they wanted one. Um, and you know, compare that to the headline here: one in four Americans were able to get a COVID test when they wanted one. But the data, um, again, thinking about what's the proper denominator here—the proper denominator of you know, can you get a test when you want one? Isn't everybody who wants one and everyone who doesn't? It's just the people who want one. And and by mixing that up, they give this uh, you know, give this answer that makes it look like uh, we're doing better on the testing front than we actually were. So you know, lots of those kinds of issues that come up. And again, a lot of these are not coming up out of any kind of malice, any kind of particular political bias, or if they are coming up out of political bias, it's in a subtle way, it's this sort of confirmation bias. Somebody thinks through it, um, they get an answer. If the answer is, is you know, in accord with what they believe or the political leaning of the outlet or whatever, then they don't necessarily carefully check the, the, the analysis that it took to get there, and then they and then they publish this. But you know, very little of this is, I think, you know, people deliberate of what I just showed you is people deliberately trying to bend the truth. There may be other strong examples. One of the things that's, that's hit us hardest, and one of the most important parts of the book that uh, that we write about is is the notion of selection bias. You know, and and I interpret this quite generally for the purpose of the book. Um, so this is something that that uh, if you don't have a strong statistical background. Uh, you can still see through an awful lot of the statistical analyses and studies that are done by just thinking about selection bias. And what it is, is when the people or the objects that you sample differ systematically from the population at large with respect to the question you're asking. So if the people, you know, if you, um, if you want to know how tall the average American is going to measuring people on the, uh, on the A court at the university gym is, is it, it, for basketball court at the university gym is a bad place to do it because the people playing on the A court are good basketball players who are taller than average and, and so on. And so these kinds of mistakes, um, you know, repeatedly produce misleading estimates about populations and cause all kinds of problems. So one example that we saw really early on just to get, get started with this uh, was the mask mouth story. So these dentists in New York city noticed in, um, in May, 2020 that, uh, 
that their patients who are coming into the dentist then were much sicker in terms of severe um, you know, oral hygiene problems than the ones they'd be, been seeing in January. And they said, well, what's changed? What's changed is that everyone's wearing masks now. It must be that wearing a mask is causing all kinds of dental problems. So they uh, went public about all of this. And of course, what they'd forgotten to think about or were avoiding thinking about was the fact that um, who goes to the dentist uh, during uh, the first wave of the pandemic in New York City when everybody is frightened and, and locked down and so on. You're not gonna go to the dentist for your routine cleaning or for a, or for a simple cavity that's not causing any immediate problems. You're only gonna go if you're suffering from severe gum disease, you've got a tooth that's um, badly infected, you've got real serious problems. And so it wasn't that the masks had caused any change, it was just that the population of patients that were willing to actually make, um, you know, actually go to the dentist um, during that pandemic, where it was very, very different. And, and so that led these guys wrong. One of the places that it hit us the most, the sort of selection bias issue hit us the most during the pandemic was in trying to estimate the infection fatality rate. So early in a pandemic, we need to know how lethal a disease is. It's one of the it's one of the things that we, you know, that is hardest to figure out early on, especially if you think there may be, uh, you know, reasonable amounts of asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic disease. Um, you basically you often have a reasonable count for the number of deaths that are occurring, but you usually have very little way of knowing how many cases there have been if there's if there aren't these you know really decisive diagnostics of, of disease. Um, and so what you have to do early on, and this is of course a key parameter, if the, you know, if the, disease, is, if the disease is killing one person in, in 20, um, you're dealing with a very different kind of catastrophe than if the disease is killing one person in 10,000. And so, um, so this is one of the first things you try to figure out early on during a pandemic. And we're all desperately trying to figure out um, in, in March, April, May, 2020, and was very hard to pin down to anything, you know, tighter than you know, half a percent to 5% at the time. Um, so, so let's look at how a couple of, how this could go wrong. So here were a couple of doctors. These are part of America's frontline doctors. For those of you who follow that, these are the doctors, you know, the, the, the demon, the demon sperm doctors and um, who were, who were, um, you know, anti-mask, anti-vax, anti everything except for hydroxychloroquine. Um, so these two guys owned uh, um, urgent care, some urgent care clinics um, in Bakersfield, and they wanted to try to estimate this infection fatality rate. So to do that, they they knew how many deaths had, had occurred in in uh, in March 2020 um, from coronavirus, and uh, they just needed to know how many infections there had been. So what they did was they tested people who were coming into their clinics, and they found that uh, 340 of the 5,200 people who came into their clinics were were positive. Um, and so from that information, they were then, uh, they were then able to, um, to uh, estimate that uh, the, the sort of cumulative incidence in, in California by that point was about 12%. And so the infection fatality rate for this thing was 0.03% lower than the flu, if that had been right. The mistake they made, obviously, is that people coming to the urgent care clinic um, in March 2020 in California were not a random sample of... Uh, of, of Californians, like they assumed they were, rather they were you know, the urgent care clinic. Um, first of all, you didn't want to go to the urgent care clinic unless because everyone was afraid you'd get COVID there. You didn't want to go unless you had something really wrong with you. And second of all, they were known to be the only place in Bakersfield where you could get a COVID test at the time. They had the only COVID tests. So the population that was going into that urgent care facility was completely different from the general um, Californian population. Um, and so they ended up with this massive overestimate of, of, uh, of the incidents in California, and that led to this massive underestimate of the uh, infection fatality rate by, you know, at least tenfold, probably uh, 20-fold uh, at that time, maybe higher. So um, you might think, well, that's just, you know, a couple of crackpot doctors at, uh, um, at, you know, at a Bakersfield urgent care clinic, but unfortunately, one of the most influential papers in the early part of the pandemic um, with some very, very big names from Stanford and, and USC and other uh, places uh, made almost exactly the same mistake. This was you know, the first, one of the first uh, um, large scale uh, studies that was made public about seroprevalence in, in, in the community. Um, and this, found, this study found a very, very high uh, seroprevalence in Santa Clara County, 
leading to headlines like this, um, which you know, uh, for April 2020, were incredibly high, up to 4% of Silicon Valley is already infected with the coronavirus, things like that. So this paper, which was released as a, as a preprint, not even I think on one of the regular preprint servers, but just you know, put up on, a, on some other kind of independent website, um, ended up making it all the way through sort of uncritically to the wide, wide mass media. Um, the problem is, was the spectacular selection bias in the way that, that patients were recruited for the study. There were various problems, actually. The, uh, the, um, the confidence intervals included uh, no one having been infected um, and things like that, which we never heard about when we heard about the point estimate. Um, <clears throat> so the way that, uh, the, way that uh, the, the patients were recruited for the study was by ads on Facebook. And so here's this ad that they put up, come participate in our community study. Um, the wife of one of the investigators sent out this message um, to, to all these Facebook groups saying, you know, oh, hey, you should come in and get tested. Why? Um, uh, for peace of mind, you'll know if you're immune. If you have antibodies against the virus, and this is completely false, of course, but if you have antibodies against the virus, you're free from the danger of getting sick or spreading the virus. So it's not even true, but these ads that they were recruiting on Facebook for were deliberately trying to tell people, hey, if you think you've already been infected, you should come and get tested. And so they're enriching very, very strongly for the people who've had symptoms. And so, um, you know, subsequently, there are lots of, you, know, you can track down this kinds of things people were writing on social media about why they had gone and participated in this study. And here's someone who, you know, had lost taste of smell and, and lost sense of taste and smell and um, scratchy throat and cough uh, after a trip. Um, so they went in to get tested. Uh, someone else went because they'd been sick the week before, um, and uh, you know, and, and noted that, that, that this you know test, the study didn't even try to correct for these uh, um, for this selection bias. You know, they they uh, didn't try to uh, you know use the data about whether people had even had recent flu-like symptoms um, in that. And so the same thing happened with this study that happened with the Bakersfield doctor story was that they. Uh, ended up because they were basically recruiting people who, who thought they probably had already had COVID and only such people, um, essentially only such people, the study filled up extremely quickly before uh, anyone else could get in to see it. And, you know, who, again, in the middle of a pandemic, who drives across the, across the Bay Area in order to get a, in order to get a test to see if they've had COVID, um, you know, you're not going to do that unless you think you've had COVID and, 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 and it's made worse if someone assures you that, you know, if, if it turns out you've had it, then you don't have to worry anymore and you won't transmit it and so on. So they ended up with this highly biased sample and, and, uh, and so then ended up with these uh, ridiculously low uh, um, estimates of, uh, of infection fatality rate that were uh, you know, below, below a tenth of a percent, um, which, were, which were off um, probably for, at that time, off probably by an order of magnitude. So the thing is, is, you know, when you read a paper, even if you're not going through the statistical methodology in a lot of details, you can look at just the, the method section to see how the paper, how the, how the, the subjects were, were included. And this is something I do every single paper I'm looking at, right? And what you're looking for is not what you see, but what you don't see. Like, uh, you know, what's, what's being obscured? You know, what, what, what part of the sample is being missed? What are the possible sources of selection bias that, that could be that could be creeping into the study. And, and unless there've been very careful efforts made to eliminate that, um, the study should be suspect. And so, um, you know, here's an example of where you've got misinformation directly in science. It's not just about science, but it's, you know, these selection bias problems are, show up in so much of what we, what we read in the scientific literature. Um, and then there's sort of a really spectacular example of how selection bias came back to bite us. Um, the, the most spectacular example in my opinion. And this is how we managed to miss for six weeks that the, that the disease was circulating widely in the United States. So March 4th, California saw its, you know, officially saw its first uh, day with, uh, with, with 10 new COVID infections. But um, based on retrospective analyses, it looks like uh, by January 24th, we were already with, with high probability seeing 10 new people, 10 people infected a day. So how did we manage to miss that for, for a month and a half? Um, same thing, you know, it's not just California, same kind of thing uh, um, nationwide. Um, by February 21st, we were probably having 10 locally transmitted cases in many of the states, basically all the big states um, already. So, so how did we miss that? The way we missed that was the testing criteria. What did you have to do to get a COVID test? 
Um, and I remember this, my, my, uh, my son was, was uh, actually had, had influenza um, in, uh, and we were in New York at the time and couldn't, couldn't get him a COVID test. Um, and why not? Well, he, uh, he, this is 2020, this is February, 2020, late February, 2020, testing required recent travel to Wuhan or exposure to a known US case. So under this approach, right, who are you going to test? You're going to test, um, you're going to test people who've, who've, who've been in Wuhan or people who've been exposed by identified U.S. COVID cases. Um, so you will only find um, either imported cases or the, um, or the cases that you've identified in your contact, because we were doing heavy contact tracing at the time, right? Heavy contact tracing and quarantining or the identified contact traced in quarantine cases that are gonna be shut down. You'll never find widespread, you know, uh, stealth community transmission because you're not testing anybody who could be a recipient of one of these cases. And so we did this testing and then this testing was used as evidence that this wasn't, um, you know, that this wasn't, we would say, well, we haven't detected any cases of community transmission, but we'd actually picked selection criteria that guaranteed that we would not detect such, and that was a serious problem there. Um, let's see, so, um, so um, let's see. So, you know, we see this kind of selection bias stuff all the time. Here's, a, here's an example um, for, uh, um, from a communication I got from the University of Washington a few days ago. Um, so supposedly we have a mask mandate in place. Uh, we, have, we have a mask mandate in place and supposedly we have a vaccination mandate in place, but there were two problems at the time this email was sent out. One of them was that the, vas that the mask mandate um, was, uh, was honor system. So you just, it mandated, or sorry, the vaccine mandate was honor system. It, it, they required that you, was, that you attest that you've been vaccinated, but they weren't actually checking to see if you were telling the truth. Um, and then the other problem was that, uh, was that this wasn't gonna be enforced and it still isn't gonna be enforced until January, 2021 after the Delta wave is over. So not a whole lot of point to that. Anyway, we get this email from our, from our president, all the faculty do, that says we're encouraged by the fact that uh, the community members of the community members who were, the, the number of community members who report being fully vaccinated with vaccination rates well above 90% for students and personnel who have completed this attestation process. In other words, um, of those who logged on to tell us that they were vaccinated, over 90% said they were vaccinated, which is not particularly um, encouraging. Uh, what they didn't tell us, of course, was that 40% uh, uh, hadn't logged on to claim this at all. And, uh, and so, you know, the, and presumably there's strong selection bias. Like, why are you going to log on and claim you're vaccinated if there's no penalty for not doing so? Um, you know, most people aren't going to log on just to tell a lie. And so, so the, you know, the giving us this 90% figure for the people that, that had logged on was, was of course, highly misleading. So these are the kinds of selection bias problems that we see all the time. Um, another area that we spend a lot of time with in the course is, is the issues of correlation versus causation. Um, let's see. Uh, so, you know, here's something that just, that just uh, this, was, this was a study that was in uh, the Mortality and Morbidity Weekly Reports uh, this, this last week from, from the CDC. Um, it was a study that supposedly uh, it um, showed that uh, there was um, that, you know, and, I, and I'm a huge supporter of, of mask mandates in schools. I think that masks do work. Um, but I think we don't, you know, talking about misinformation in science, I think we don't do ourselves any favors when we bring forward weak evidence that doesn't show what we claim it does and then make these misleading claims. So this, this, this showed up in every mainstream news outlet saying that masking in school, you know, CDC study shows that masking in schools works. Um, so the paper starts off by saying, we assess the impact of masking in schools on CDC incidents. That's a directly, that's a, on, on COVID-19 incidents, that's a directly causal claim. Uh, what's the impact of masking in schools on incidents, right? Um, and then, so they, so they lead with this strong causal claim. And then in the, in the, you know, 
caveat section at the very end of the paper, they back off and say, oh, no, no, it's just a correlation. This is an ecological study. Causation can't be inferred. But of course, that part gets missed. That's not the part that goes um, and, and makes it into all of the headlines. And as a result, um, you know, the, the headlines then claim that there's this really strong evidence where, you know, in this particular study, it's lacking. The people who oppose masks aren't stupid. They're able to find these kinds of uh, lapses, and then they can use that as uh, evidence, if, you know, for their own um, you know, anti-mask propaganda. So this is a this is a dangerous kind of mistake to make. Um, and in fact, this is really really widespread in uh, in in health research. So uh, a third of journal articles in one particular uh, in one particular study. Um, made kind of mistakes like the ones that I just showed you where they misattribute causality based on correlative evidence. And uh, then that gets amplified even worse. Um, so a third of the articles, journal articles do it. Um, uh, half of news articles about scientific studies do it. And you know, I didn't put this in this, in this paper, but when, uh, when they do that, 95% of the news articles that get this wrong um, got it directly out of the press release. So a third of the journal articles misattribute, but about half of press releases are misattributing. And, and so that's one of the places that press offices are contributing to this problem. Um, let's see, so, uh, so here's, I'm just gonna give you one kind of fun example. Um, this, was a study, this was a report in Forbes, um, or yeah. So bald men at higher risk of severe coronavirus symptoms. And so these authors, had observed a correlation by my dotted line here between baldness and COVID risk, and they had a proposed mechanism. They were proposing that there were certain endocrine factors that, uh, that predisposed one to both baldness and COVID risk. And they had these very complicated, um, this is a, a, a figure from the paper, they had these very complicated uh, um, you know, uh, endocrine pathways that they thought were leading both to um, male pattern baldness and to um, upregulation up of the ACE2 receptor that allows, uh, um, that allows uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus to enter, um, to enter cells. And, uh, and so, you know, that's a possibly plausible hypothesis, but uh, they weren't thinking very clearly about causality and, the, and the, uh, the, the, when Forbes was forced to run this retraction. This piece has been clarified to note that the study did not control for age which is a risk factor for hair loss and severe COVID. So maybe there's that whole fancy complicated um, causal pathway that we saw previously, but, uh, but they didn't think about the fact, they didn't control for the fact that there, there was a very well-known causal pathway between age and, and both baldness and COVID severity. So you know, thinking about causation is so important. Um, here's another one, this one I found this morning. This is from the University of Michigan's uh, Human Resources Department explaining why if you've got long COVID, you should go back to work anyway. Um, and the, the, so the, the manager of their human resources, uh, uh, work, you know, work, working, work program, um, who, you know, of course, reports directly to the financial officer, um, says, you know, he has this whole little article about why you need to start going back to work if you've got long COVID or things like that. And they say, we know without question that the sooner an employee returns to work, the better their recovery is going to be. As if the causality moves from return to work time to recovery instead of from recovery to return to work time. So, um, you know, just yet another example of how these kinds of fallacies, and I think you're kind of seeing the patterns here, they're pervading, you know, social media discussions, they're pervading news discussions, they're pervading scientific discussions, and they're pervading the sort of BS that we get from university administrators, right? Um, really cool one. I'm going to give, kind of wrap up with two last little themes here. Um, Simpson's paradox, this is this classic statistical uh, fallacy uh, or, or problem that arises where you can, uh, it, if, you, if you have stratified data of some sort and you don't notice that stratification, you can get trends wrong. So if I ran a regression through the eight points here, I would get this downward sloping curve, but actually I've got two different classes here, a red class and a blue class. And if I understand that they're different populations, then I'd get these upward sloping curves, right? That's Simpson's paradox. It's one of these things you teach in statistics classes. And one of these things that I had thought was fairly rare, but so cool that it always gets taught. And then the reason we always use the same examples, the, the Berkeley uh, uh, graduate school admission rates by gender, that kind of thing is because this isn't so common in the wild. Um, 
not everyone agrees with me about that. And I need to spend some more time deciding whether I, I'm right or wrong about that. But the, but here's an example from COVID that's so amazing. I've got to share it with you. So this is recently, you may have heard, um, uh, you know, a few months ago, all of this concern that, um, that uh, the vaccines were not working well. The, the Pfizer vaccine was not working well against the Delta strain in Israel. And uh, so the aggregate data and in, um, and this may have even been partly responsible for, uh, for Biden's announcement that we would have widespread uh, boosters here in the United States. So the aggregate data out of Israel suggested that the vaccine only had about 67% efficacy during versus severe disease. So um, it only, uh, in other words, it only reduces your chance of, uh, of getting disease, um, you know, from, uh, it reduces, reduces, it reduces your chance. So the idea would be that, so an efficacy number like this says that the, the reduction in your chance of get, getting disease is about threefold, right? So you're, um, instead of, you know, getting, for, instead of getting it um, at some baseline probability of, of one, whatever you're getting at a baseline probability of 0.67. So it's about a threefold, um, I'm sorry, you're getting it at a baseline probability. Uh, it's, it's protecting 0.67 of that. So you're getting it at probably about a third of, the, of what you would have if you're vaccinated. That's okay. That's you know that's that's what our original targets were for for vaccine efficacy. But obviously, it's not good compared to what we thought we were getting with Pfizer. Really scary, and uh, a lot of people are very very worried about that from looking at the aggregate numbers. This is a mistake that, that doesn't really appear in most of the published literature on this, but we saw it a lot in the media. The thing is, there's a pattern here. There's a there's a confound, which is that there are very different vaccination rates in older people and younger people. So um, older people are much more likely to be vaccinated. Older people are also much more likely to suffer severe disease. Now, if we look at uh, if we look at the um, uh, if we look at the unvaccinated population, um, you know, older people are at are at much higher risk. If we look at vaccinated population, older people are at much higher risk. That means that we can do this thing of, of you know stratifying the data again. What if we look at all the people who are under fifty? If we look at the people who are under fifty. The vaccine is 91% effective. If we look at people who are over 50, the vaccine's 85% effective. So you would think that if we look at everybody put together, you would think that the efficacy should be somewhere in between 85 and 91%, but it's not, it's 67%. And that makes it look really, really bad. But what's going on here is that most unvaccinated people are young and don't get severe disease. Most vaccinated people, you know, mo uh, most old people are vaccinated. They're the ones that do get severe disease. And so what it's making it look like is that unvaccinated people are much better protected than they really are because unvaccinated people also happen to be young and are, they're protected by their youth, not by their unvaccinated status. But it, it, it's giving you this misleading impact of a you know, sense of what vaccination is doing. So it's a beautiful Simpsons paradox example where the, where the um, efficacy in the population at large is much, much lower than the efficacy in either age group. And so this is something that gets fixed in, in, um, in you know, any sensible uh, you know, you know, scientific analysis of these situations, but, but doesn't get fixed um, you know, when people are just throwing out raw numbers and, and talking about them in the media and so on. So being aware of that kind of stuff is, is interesting. I'm gonna conclude with a few words about data visualization. And this is another place where we see all of this kind of uh, um, you know, misleading, um, uh, uh, you know, d misleading information, right? These days, so much of the information that we see is presented in the form of data. No one wants to look at tables. So it's typically presented in the form of data viz. And over and over again, we see these misleading data visualizations. Here's the Trump White House bragging about the uh, effective um, testing program that they've rolled out. And you can see this really, you know, look at that number of tests just taking off. Um, and that looks really awesome until you realize that this is not uh, daily tests. This is the cumulative number of tests that have been given. It's not labeled as that, but this is the cumulative number of tests that have been given in the United States. And that's a straight line, which means testing capacity hasn't increased at all. This is, uh, it's, it's the same trick that Tim Cook did uh, um, famously in, a, in an Apple shareholders meeting. He showed cumulative sales for the iPhone because iPhone sales were actually dropping, but with cumulative sales, it covered that up. So this was one example of that kind of thing. Um, here was, a, here was a, a scientific paper that tried to claim that COVID was causing lots of risks 
among, uh, among even people below the age of 44. And you look at this and it says, wow, look at that. Like, here's these different age groups. And, and yeah, people of the age 44 are being, you know, they're not dying as much, but they're being hospitalized as much of, uh, as, as people above age 44. But the thing is, look at this, the bins are different. These are 10 year bins. This is a 25 year bin. And so again, you know, this, the, the data, the numbers may be exactly right, but it gives you a really misleading impression when you look at it. Um, so that's this, you know, the, this bin size issue there. Um, this one, this one ran in the New York Times recently. This was just an example of the kind of you know silly ways that data can mislead. Um, so this is this is, uh, and, and and it's also an example of a rule we teach, you know, which is which is just using kind of um, your intuition about you know patterns that look too strong to be real. They probably are. So this is the uh, this is the um, the fraction of adults that would that would definitely or probably get vaccinated. So these dark ones are people that definitely get vaccinated, light ones want people that aren't. And, and this is county by county data. Um, but if you look at this, you'll notice these just remarkably strong effects of state boundaries. And you think like, why would that possibly be? And it turns out that even though they've plotted these data at the county level, what they've actually done, the survey has been run at the state level. And then they've tried to interpolate using demographic factors at the county level. So what you're actually seeing here is um, mostly the effect of their of of their state by state survey with some sort of noise thrown onto it at the at the county level, um, but it's a really misleading graph because it makes you think that this is county level data when uh, when in fact it absolutely isn't and 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 clearly the interpolation isn't any good given this given the remarkable strength of county borders in the thing. The funny thing about this story, I complained about this, and the funny thing about this story was that. Um, uh, was, was that that was the least of my problems. It turned out that the New York Times had screwed up and double counted um, the people who were very hesitant. So what they did is, is, is the, the number of vaccine hesitant people here, they said were the number of people that were very hesitant plus the number of people that were hesitant. But the, but the, uh, the, the hesitant scores that they were working from included the very hesitant classes. And so they were effectively double counting those who were vaccine very hesitant. And so the entire graph has the, it has the effect of making Americans look about 10% more vaccine hesitant than they really are. And I think the point of this, you know, is that even, you know, New York Times runs one of the tightest ships in terms of data graphics and all that. They're very good. They've got a large team of uh, people, even these sources, when it comes down to it, you know, we're getting misinformation inadvertently through, um, through sources like this. And, 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 you know, if they're, if they're messing that up, I mean, if you're pretty much guaranteed that, that most other outlets are making a comparable number of mistakes. This was a kind of interesting one. This was, uh, this was Georgia um, talking about, uh, about their, uh, um, this is from 2020, um, talking about, about case rates. Um, and if you look at these two maps, it looks like, um, for, you know, oops, sorry. Uh, looks like, sorry, I have to move this around. It looks like over a two week period, you don't have a significant uh, or substantial increase in, in cases in Georgia, which would be really good news. But what's happened here is that the bins have changed. So um, the red bin uh, has a lower bound of, of uh, 2,900 cases here and of, of uh, 3,800 cases here. So the whole scale has changed, making the map look approximately the same, even though things have got substantially worse. And a lot of people got upset about this. And they said, well, you know, Georgia is so awful, they're covering this up. And I think for something like this, it's important to invoke what we, you know, what's known as Hanlon's razor. Um, Hanlon's razor is the idea that never ascribed to malice, what can be adequately explained by incompetence. And to that, I would add, never ascribed to incompetence, what could be an understandable mistake. And I think what happened here is that these software packages, these cartographic software packages auto automatically scale the bins. And so when someone put this together, they were just using the auto scalings. They hadn't really you know, expected people to necessarily be comparing one day against the next and using that as an indicator of how bad things were. It was more meant to be a comparison of the relative badness in different communities. And, uh, and so they just went with the defaults in this, in this plotting program. And they ended up with this graph that, that that tells a misleading story. So I mean, it's important to understand that not all of these, and I think that's one of the themes of the talk is that there's a ton of misinformation out there. I could have talked a lot more about all the deliberately planted stuff. I've been trying to talk about the stuff that gets in there by accident. Um, this one was an amazing one. Um, so here's, here's uh, CNBC with this and then later picked up by Trump. Um, 
So CNBC says there's a much better than expected uh, um, J-shaped recovery from, uh, from in terms of job losses. So things are going along like this for jobs and then we plummet and then look at that, we're right back up to where we wanna be. Wow, what a great story for America, right? Well, the problem is, is that what they've plotted here is the derivative. So we have, we're going along okay, and we have huge losses and a minor gain. And uh, so Trump tells this story too. And so here was my, you know, sort of analogy, the Mariners mounting the extraordinary ninth inning comeback, um, going along flat, uh, scores are tied through the sixth. Mariners are down five, you know, give up five runs to the Tigers in the fifth, give up four runs to the Tigers in the, in the fourth, pick up one extra run in the ninth, and if you graph it this way, you'd think the Mariners won the game, but actually, of course, they got beat um, quite badly. So these are sort of the ways that, again, data graphics can mislead. I'm, let's see, how are we? I'm going to, I'd rather take your questions. I'm happy to come back and talk about the IHME if people want to talk about the IHME's um, models and how that ended up misleading national policy. But I want to make sure I don't miss people's questions. So my main point with all of this is that designers have this enormous latitude to determine how you feel about the data that you end up seeing. Um, even if they use the right numbers, the sort of the story that you take away from it comes very much from the from the um, from the way the design choices they make. And it's one of the reasons in our class that we encourage people to get a hold of original data and to replot them in ways that they think are uh, might make more sense and to see if different stories emerge. So how do we end up cleaning up our information environment? I think, you know, we're, we're um, all, you know, uh, in, in this audience, professional scientists, we've got this rich training in, in scientific and quantitative um, uh, thinking. And what can we do? Because, you know, clearly society needs to have access to good information in order to be able to make good decisions. And so I just put together a few rules. We could talk about this for hours as well. But one of the most important things I think is don't be intimidated by numbers. Realize, learn how to ask questions of numbers, learn how to see through misleading numbers. And then conversely, because we are, many of us in, in you know, positions of epistemic privilege, don't use numbers to intimidate. Um, don't be part of the problem. We need to accept uncertainty and acknowledge uncertainty. So a lot of the time, you know, the reason that the uncertainty vacuum was so dangerous was because the media wanted sharp answers. And, you know, when they would call up, I mean, I had this conversation with a reporter at one of the major national newspapers who called me and said, uh, I think the CDC, this was, you know, maybe April, 2020, I think the CDC is covering something up because um, I keep talking to them and, and I ask them what the infection fatality rate is. And all they'll tell me is it's between half a percent and 5%. Like, what is it really? And what are they covering up? And I said, look, you know, like, I'm not a huge fan of what's going on at the CDC right now, but this is one place where they're being completely honest with you and completely transparent. And the answer is nobody knows. It could be anywhere in that range. Um, but of course, what the news media wants is they want to have a sharp story. They want to be able to say, oh, you know, here's a good scientist at a good institution who says it's not as bad as the flu. Or here's a good scientist as a good institution who says this is going to be worse than the, 19, the 1918 uh, flu pandemic or, or whatever. And those are the stories that end up making it forward. If we can accept that uncertainty and acknowledge it, that's going to help people understand what it is that we're actually saying and avoid the loss of trust that then comes downstream. Another huge problem is this cherry picking issue. So whenever uh, a new study comes out, and we, you know, we've seen this in other places too. Um, when a new study comes out, we, uh, we, you know, um, that's often treated in the media as if it's like the final word in something, you know, so a study shows that heart disease and eating chocolate are correlated, then, then that comes out and that's the last word on that. And it doesn't take it into the context of the fact that there's already a big literature about heart disease and chocolate and wine and all that other stuff. So every study that comes out needs to be taken in the context of a bigger literature. It's not the last word, it's in the words of my colleague, Natalie Dean, it's a pebble on the scale of one of a number of alternative hypotheses. And, um, we need to question our sources, right? As we read these sources, ask yourself the same questions that reporters ask, who's telling me this? How do they know it? What are they trying to sell me? We need to triangulate different sources of information. If you hear something from one place, you know, if it's only coming from one source, maybe be skeptical. It starts to you start to hear that coming from multiple sources and independent ones, not just newspapers copying each other, which has become all too common in social media with the race to, to get information out there first, um, then that information starts to become more reliable. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, you know, be aware of the information landscape that we live in and the various ways that misinformation pervades the information landscape. Um, 
And I think you know, this is really important that outreach helps on all scales, whether it's talking to CNN live, whether it's talking to your family, um, whether it's you know, somewhere in the middle posting something on social media that's a nice explainer. Um, we as a scientific community owe it to the people who we serve and whose uh, who's, who's, you know, tax revenues to some large degree support our, our enterprise to bring what we know and how we have learned in our training and understanding and analyzing these problems back to them. So, you know, I urge people to, uh, for especially for crises like this, but for everything else you're doing, um, don't feel like outreach has to start at some grand scale. Remember that the little conversations um, as well um, count as outreach. They're important in terms, maybe you can't put them on your CV, but they taken together in the aggregate, they change the way we think about things um, as, a, as, as, a, as, a, um, as a community. And that's amazingly important. And then finally, this is my last slide. Um, Neil Postman, the great sociologist, uh, his, he wrote the first paper, academic paper on bullshit. And, and in there he has his third law. At any given time, the chief, chief source of bullshit with which you have to contend is yourself. You may be um, better than I am about that. It's certainly true about me. And so one of the things that I try to do very, very hard is to be extremely skeptical of things that I convince myself of or things that confirm my pre-existing beliefs and try to always, and you know, we could talk a lot more about how to do this, but I, you know, try to always avoid bullshitting myself just because it's, you know, the thing I want to hear. And, uh, and so I guess I'll close with that. Thank you so much for your time and attention and for the invitation. It's a real honor to speak to you. And I think I've left at least a little bit of time for questions. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bergstrom. Thank you, we appreciate it. Um, who knew that this would also be a, a nice uh, sort of slideshow of his photograph. So now you all believe me when I tell you to go to his website and check out uh, the photography bit there. So I just want to reassure everyone that I got a very enthusiastic response from Professor Bergstrom when, I, when we asked him to be our keynote. So he's very excited to take your questions. Um, I felt very happy to be a postdoc. You don't really get nice emails a lot of times. but So just want to encourage everyone uh, to ask questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Uh, amazing talk, Carl. Just, just really great. Especially having followed on Twitter, and it's just, it was a, it's a continuing nightmare. <laughs> it's a continuing nightmare, indeed. Um, I was wondering what you thought about. So, I think you know, reading with this critical eye, these individual studies, yeah. that yeah. feels doable. But what feels harder is so. One thing I've noticed with, say, now ivermectin, so to sort of yeah, medical, right. Mm -hmm. Is the proponents have not just sort of ivermectin studies; they have pre-generated ivermectin meta-analysis websites where they sort of purport right. to be these encyclopedias of all the That's right. And so I wonder you know, if you had thoughts about how to navigate that. How do you <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is fascinating, actually. And it's kind of one of the ongoing mysteries for me that I don't have uh, completely worked out. So I showed you very early on in the slideshow, I was talking about astroturfing. I showed you a, a hydrochloroquine uh, website. It turns out that that hydrochloroquine website is made by the same people who was made by the same people who now run the, that, uh, the, that, the glossiest, leadingest uh, ivermectin meta-analysis website. So with the hydrochloroquine one, they learned a fair bit. So the hydrochloroquine one, everyone had been saying, um, everyone had been saying, you know, oh, you can't, use ecological studies, you need randomly controlled trials. So they thought they'd try to pull a fast one on Fauci and everybody else. And so they claimed in that, that they had done a country randomized trial, which was a term they had made up, didn't exist anywhere else, that included 2.6 billion people because they had learned that large numbers were better for doing, for doing randomly uh, controlled trials. So when that first one came up, it was transparently ludicrous. They were quick. So I pointed out some of the reasons this was just ridiculous on Twitter. Um, they were editing it in real time in response to the things I was criticizing about it. And within a few days, they kind of backfilled it to take out most of the things I'd criticized. Um, and, and that's a problem. And it also makes you like, you know, think about, well, how do you, you know, it, I mean, it's almost like a bar fight. You don't, you know, bar fight has to end with the first punch, right? Otherwise, um, you know, otherwise you're going to end up losing. It's kind of the same thing with trying to debunk these, uh, these really well-organized uh, 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 astroturfing, you know, things. I didn't, 
they didn't lose with my first punch, you know? And, and so instead they just backfilled and came and I just basically, you know, I, yes, I discredited that particular website, but I also helped that larger movement write more compelling BS. Um, one of the fascinating things about all of that was we were never able to figure out who those people actually were. There were some very good clues. Um, and we know that they were, that some of the main authors were among the leading, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, COVID denialists on, uh, on, on Twitter and other social media venues. Um, but I will talk to some very good um, uh, computer security people at some of the major tech um, companies that, and, and they were unable to figure out who actually owned and registered the website. And it had this very odd property that the statistics were sort of, you know, inadequate for a high school statistics class, but the, uh, but the security on the website and the, the way that they had cloaked the identity of who the group was, was basically, you know, uh, uh, nation state grade. And so very, very interesting signature of, of, uh, you know, sort of organized astroturfing. So these, they probably found some useful idiots to do the, to do the analysis. Um, but you had some, someone bigger with a lot more money and expertise putting that up. And they are the ones running the site you just showed me. So what do you do about that? I think for things like that, I think you have to throw that, that baby has to be thrown out with the bathwater because it's so contaminated that, I mean, you, the, 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 you know, I basically, I try not to trust information that comes from, I try, I, I basically just try not to even engage with information that comes from, that, that, that's been collected under a roof with bad intent. And so that's been my approach to that, to that particular ivermectin uh, meta-analysis. And so instead, I would just say, I can't trust that at all. Um, you know, take someone like uh, uh, Gideon Myrit's cat, um, and uh, who is you know good epidemiologist? He did a meta analysis on this. I'll look at that. That the problem is is that's not going to convince the proponents. Um, they're not going to accept the fact that I'm just going to completely throw out what they think is their best source of data. So I don't have an answer to that. Um, I believe there is a question in the chat. Joseph, I'll let you ask that. Well, actually, one of our attendees raised their hand, so I'm going to allow her to talk. Uh, Ileana, if you're ready, um, I'm going to. Press this button that says allow to talk. So go ahead. Yes, hello. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, hi. Thank you very much for this nice, very nice presentation. Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, and um, I was wondering, because I worked a little bit on the COVID stuff, uh, you have talked about the case fatality rate. Um, a, a question and uh, an observation, actually. Uh, and we know that case fatality rate for COVID, for instance, is the ratio between the death and number of death and the number of positive cases, right? For the case Detected. fatality rate, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the problem is that <clears throat> I work with different countries. And um, when we have the study for this, we mentioned in our study because the detection rate was very different. Because why? Because the... Um, the sequencing actually was extremely different from country to country. And um, it's very different. And <clears throat> finally, we couldn't find the correlation because it's hard to, and this is a bias actually coming from a lot of studies that we saw on COVID-19. So this is a very important point that you actually, you, you pointed out uh, the case fatality rate. Uh, it's not always the best indicator actually uh, to judge, you know, and this is a point that appears a lot in, in the COVID papers. Yes. Uh, we should take care of that. I think we yeah, have I think, some I mean, other comment. So you, you bring up a really important point, which is that, you know, um, there's, there's a case fatality rate, which where the denominator is the number of uh, detected or diagnosed cases. And then there's an infection fatality rate, which where the denominator is the total number of cases detected or otherwise, right? So the, the case fatality rate is often something you can calculate fairly directly if you have a decent reporting system. You have a number of reported deaths, you have a number of reported cases, you divide one by the other, you're done. Problem is, is as you point out, it's got these huge biases. What we really wanna know is that infection fatality rate, which shouldn't um, be, dependent on, um, you know, say the, the diagnostic, diagnostic uh, technology being used in different places because, uh, because something goes into the denominator, whether it was detected or not. Uh, the problem is, of course, is then figuring out what that denominator is. And I think that's where a lot of the problems flowed in was that uh, a lot of epidemiologists 
you know, did feel like they wanted to be working with infection fatality rates, not case fatality rates. Um, but then there was a lot of argument about how to estimate that infection fatality rate. So great point. Any more questions from our Thank audience? You. I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A in here. Um, sure. So Rupinder uh, asked, how much of this misinformation do you think stems from a breakdown in the review process for scientific publications? either with free access journals, expedited reviews due to status, nepotism, or other reasons? Fantastic question. Um, I mean, COVID has been so, see, like, each question could be like a really cool like seminar. I mean, it's just so much to talk about with, with this whole information ecosystem and how it interacts with science. I mean, COVID's done so many interesting things for biomedicine. I mean, it sort of pushed biomedicine from being anti-preprint, extremely reluctant to do that to almost a ridiculous degree. Um, and pushed us into acting almost like, you know, economic, economics or physics with, you know, relying on preprint culture. Everything about COVID goes on to MedArchive. We, we needed it because we needed to act rapidly. We don't have time to screw around, uh, you know, with, with these, you know, six-month review processes and things like that in, in the face of an emergent pandemic. Problem being, of course, is that then peer review gets cut or, you know, uh, pre-publication peer review gets cut out of the cycle and, and uh, you have this unreviewed stuff on MedArchive and, and there can be these catastrophic cases like the one I showed you at the start where someone said there was HIV genome in COVID uh, or in SARS-CoV-2. Um, that said, I think that we've transitioned quite well around the, um, around the preprint culture to doing rapid post-publication peer review. I think that's been a really neat development. Um, I think the places that we're doing it are not really optimized for, for that. And I hope that'll continue to evolve right now. An awful lot of that is occurring on Twitter, which is a really stupid platform for, you know, 280 character um, posts for, for where you can't, you know, show equations is a really stupid place to try to talk about the subtle details of, of statistical analyses in, in scientific papers. That kind of turned out where we're doing it. Some of it's on pub peer, but that's got a really negative connotation. Um, you know, that's mostly just for harsh critiques as opposed for to constructive and so on. So, so I think that's kind of evolving. Definitely the sort of, I feel like the standards of peer review have dropped substantially. I mean, that Lancet paper, um, you know, I should have been caught, I think. Um, at the same time, it also points out what I think is a general misunderstanding of what peer review does, um, which is that uh, I, I don't think of peer review as in any way, you know, guaranteeing the accuracy or even reasonableness of a paper. I think of peer review is essentially um, being a filter that tends to enrich for papers that are more likely to be uh, accurate and critically more likely to be interesting. And so, I think if you shift to thinking about peer review uh, from being something sort of the a sacred guarantee and promise of, of that this is real science to something that helps journals enrich for uh, papers that are more likely to be interesting to their readers, both because the topics are interesting and because they might be right, um, then, then I think it's, it's a little bit easier to understand what's going on. Then the problems come up in terms of, you know, popular media misunderstandings about things and they happen in both directions, both that, you know, the popular media thinks something's peer reviewed, so it's correct and, and, and endorsed by the entire scientific community, like misperception on one side, on the other, um, you know, just anything any, anybody puts on the Med Archive or, or even gets rejected from the Med Archive, so they put it on, on you know, some document server. Um, if it's been written in LaTeX, then, then they can treat it as if it's real science. And so like, you know, sort of coming to and, 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 and not looking at the, at the rapid post-publication peer review. So I think there's like a, there's a process where we as scientists have to adapt to this. The media has to adapt to the way that we're changing so fast in real time, which is, which is tricky. Um, you know, the single biggest thing I want to see the media do, and, and, and this is where, uh, um, sort of expert disease reporters like Helen Branswell and Kai Kupferschmidt are, are so important um, is that they should basically carry out that rapid post-publication peer review. If, if Helen Branswell publishes an article about something in the archive or even in JAMA, you know damn well that that article is gonna include quotes from four or five specialists um, about what to make of the paper and that those specialists, she's gonna have chosen to not be the best friends of the people who wrote the article because these really good disease reporters know everybody in the business. They know the biology as well as the biologists and they're 
you know, some of the most important links in the entire chain, more important than the vast majority of us practicing scientists, in fact. Um, I think there's one more question in the chat, but I'd actually like to ask a question myself. Um, you know, in your in the pianist paper that you authored um, with uh, Dr. West, you talked about changes that had occurred in the way science is communicated among scientists. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious as to how those changes, like what negative changes occurred there that parallel uh, the misinformation that we see in the wider public. Was there anything that sort of primed conditions for this misinformation to be uh, uh, this bad? That's really interesting. I think that um, what, what, what leaps to mind is I do feel like there's a much bigger emphasis on um, making a sort of popular media splash in the work that we do. So there seem to be much, much stronger incentives for scientists to hype their work beyond the scope of what they, um, of, of what the work actually shows. So whether it's forgetting to mention that the study that solves cancer is, was in mice or whether it's, uh, um, you know, something else. You, 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 we, we, I feel like scientists are aware that they're competing intensely for attention share the same way that Instagram users are. And exactly why that is, I, I don't completely understand some of it. Um, you know, there was a there was a uh, aggressive but I think interesting article called uh, the, the Rise of Sugar Daddy Science. So some of it was that in, as the so the claim in that article was that as the um, national funding infrastructure has backed away, scientists more and more have to cater to the whims of a few rich individuals who are doing you know so-called philanthropic. Funding and they are usually interested in things that are that are a different kind of research than what the NIH might fund. It might be sexier, it might be flashier, it might be whatever. So, so that's that may be some of what's going on. Um, I think in general, science science has been radically changed by the fact that um, over the last twenty to thirty years, by the ease with which we can do bibliometric comparisons among scientists. So, thirty years ago, if I wanted to rank two incoming job candidates in terms of say what they're uh, publication impact, what the impact of their publications was. It would be a pain to even figure out what they were unless they had their CVs. I would have to spend hours with the paper copies of the, uh, of, um, of what, you know, what the web, the, the um, journal citation reports and the web of science used to come on paper, right? And it would take up a whole wall of the library and, and it would take me hours to figure out how many people had cited a single article. Um, so the idea of like comparing, like how many times had someone been cited or what was their H index or something like that, we had no way of doing that 30 years ago. Um, now it's trivial, you can do it instantly on these machines. It's always easier to count than to read. And I think that as quantification becomes easier and easier, we rely on it more and more. That allows, um, you know, uh, Goodert's law to kick in. So these metrics are no longer good, but it even allows Campbell's law to kick in. And my colleague, Jevin West, who wrote that, paper with me, you know, said in a, in a decade ago, he said, you know, the worst thing that the worst thing that a bad um, you know, scholarly performance metric can do is not to get the wrong answer. It's to encourage the wrong science. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's another contributor. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a, a time for one more question. If not from the audience, is there a question in the chat? Joseph? Um, eliana has got her hand raised. Eliana, you, oh, I again? believe you can unmute yourself again yeah. and ask your question. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so just one question, short question. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see your presentation from the very first moments, mm -hmm. but uh, I have just a short question. Are you for an open science? Yes. Sure. Can you tell us why exactly are you for that? What do you mean by open? Or let's say open access, not open science, open access publication, because it's a difference there. I've been a heavy proponent of open access publications since um, actually around 2000. Uh, my optimism around it has decreased substantially for a bunch of complicated reasons that would be an hour long seminar. Um, I do think that in general, um, you know, that uh, this would be a really long, this is, uh, there's no way to answer this quickly and concisely. I did about five years of economic modeling in the scientific publication industry from about 2000 to 2005. And for some uh, reasons, that are somewhat complicated. Um, I do think that open access publishing, in addition to having these sort of values of making science universally available to the people that fund it, also create market incentives that will keep prices down overall. Uh, if I'm um, 
if I'm a publisher, uh, if I'm a library and I want to um, have a good library collection, I need to subscribe to both nature and science. If I'm an, if I'm an author and I want to publish a high profile paper, I'd be happy to publish twice in nature, twice in science, or once in each. So in one case, you have the, the other library trying to acquire uh, essentially complementary goods um, over, over, which the, over which there are publisher monopolies, you know, papers that have already been published. In the other case, you have uh, 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 authors trying to um, purchase uh, substitutable goods, namely slots in, in journals um, over which there are not monopolies. And so the, the basics of pricing should keep things down. Now, there are a whole bunch of complicated reasons why that hasn't worked out as well as I had hoped or expected. But uh, yeah, that would be another seminar. Well, uh, if you would all please join me in thanking uh, Professor Bergstrom one more time. Thank you all very, very much. It was really a treat. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in, in, in person. Um, this is the first Skype talk I've done to an in-person audience. Um, and I, I appreciate your patience sitting and watching a talking head on video after two years of doing that. So I'm sorry that, you're, that, that this lecture had to be that way. And thank you for putting up with it. Thank you again. Thank you. So this concludes the um, this portion of our talk, and I believe Joseph is going to come up and, and make some closing remarks. Thank you once again, Professor Bergstrom. You're you're free to head out. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone. Um, and and yes, be well. Bye. -bye.